today we're going to take a look at one of the first floppy disk systems available for the Southwest Technical 6800 computer. This one came out in late 1977. It was made by a company called Percom. This is about the same time that Southwest came out with their own floppy disk for the 6800 as well. However, the design of the two is substantially different. But today we're going to be looking at this Percom floppy and see how it's used and how its operating system functioned. Now this Percom design was actually almost the exact same thing as Northstar used for their system that they had introduced over a year prior to this. Now the introduction of that Northstar floppy disk system made quite an impact in the microcomputer marketplace because it was about one third the cost of any other floppy disk system prior to that. So as you can imagine, that big a drop in cost brought a whole new group of people who could afford a floppy disk system for the computer. And using a floppy disk was like night and day compared to what you could get done with a cassette or paper tape. So it started quite a wave of sales. Unfortunately for Southwest 6800 users, that uh, Northstar system was only available for S100 machines like the Altair or the MSI or the SOL 20. So the Southwest users basically had to wait. And as you can imagine, Southwest lost some sales during that period to the S100 computers because people wanted floppy disks. But anyway, let's take a look at this. This design is similar to Northstar because both of them used Shugart's new five and a quarter inch mini disc. Both of them used a hard sector controller. Both of them used hard sector media. Uh, it was 10 hard sectors of 256 bytes each and total of 35 tracks. So that gave you a total of 89,600 bytes per disc. All of that was the same. Their software is very similar as well. The operating system, uh, for this Percom, they call it Mini DOS, and on Northstar, it's called Northstar DOS. It's hard to even really call them a DOS. They have very, very rudimentary functions. Basically, they just replace cassette or paper tape functions like we've seen on this 6800. You could write from memory to the disk, and you could load from disk into memory um, and use a file name to do it. And of course, it was much quicker, and you didn't have to scan through tape or anything like that, like you did on cassette. So it's definitely an improvement. But it wasn't a full-fledged OS like you think of with CPM or MS-DOS or anything like that. Now where they differed was how they stored the operating system. Northstar DOS uh, was typical of what you picture when you think about booting off a disk. The operating system was on the first track or two of the disk. And when you booted it, it loaded that into RAM and ran that operating system out of RAM. Now at Percom, they were, their logic was to put the operating system into EEPROM. And that's what we see here. The default was to load it with this one EEPROM, which was called Mini DOS, and that's what we're going to demonstrate in just a minute. You add one more EEPROM, and it was what they called MPX. Um, and with the MPX PROM and the Mini DOS PROM, at that point, you pretty much had the same thing as Northstar DOS. Now, Percom went with EEPROM because their logic was these disks are so small, why waste space on these disks to put the same operating system on all of your disks? And then on top of that, you now waste RAM putting the operating system in RAM. Just Let's just put it all in EEPROM and save both of those resources. Likewise, if anything crashed or ran away and clobbered RAM with it in EEPROM, you haven't lost your operating system. And finally, you don't have to have a bootable disk to get your system up and running. You can create a disk from scratch because you don't need a disk that has the OS on it in order to boot. This is very handy for me because I did not have a bootable disk. But again, since it's all in EEPROM, the disk is nothing but a data disk. And so you just load programs into memory from cassette, or of course I also transferred them over serial port from a PC. I could then save them to disk and easily and quickly create up a disk. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and open up this computer and put the card in, and we're gonna um, fire this card up and see how it works and do some demonstrations of the Percom floppy disk for the, Al excuse me, the Southwest 6800. All right, I have the floppy controller installed inside the computer. We take a quick look at the configuration. We have our CPU board, 8K of RAM here, two 4K RAMs for a total of 16K, then the floppy disk controller that runs over to um, a single floppy disk, that single-sided, single density, about 89,000 bytes. Now the first operating system we're looking at, it's hard to even call it an operating system. It's pretty much a direct replacement for a cassette. Uh, there are no file names. You keep track of where you are on the disk with a counter, so to speak, just like you did on the cassette. Except here, the counter is a sector number. If you think about this, we have 10 sectors per track, 35 tracks, so we have 350 sectors available on this disk, and they're labeled 
are identified as 0 through 349 as far as this little OS is concerned. So with cassette, you might write down, I started this program at 37 on the counter, and this one started at 80. With this, you would write down on a piece of paper that you kept with your diskette and say, basic starts at sector 17, this program starts at sector 48, that kind of thing. So this is no file names. This is basically a direct replacement for cassette with floppy. And this is what you get with the single prom on this board that's called mini DOS. It's a, it's a numeric interface replacing your cassette basically. All right, so in this computer, I have got the demo program that we were running before. Um, oops, wrong command. And let's jump to that and run it. This is where we type a test message. And we can tell it how many times to print it, and there we go. So before we took this and we saved it out to paper tape, and we also demonstrated saving it out to cassette, now we're going to go ahead and save it to this floppy disk drive. All right, to execute the commands for the floppy disk drive, we have to jump to the prom that's on that board, and it's at C1000. And it doesn't give you any feedback at all here, really, other than the fact that the prom is now processing input. If I type something that's not a valid command, for example, I'll tell you K is not valid, it just kicks right back out to swat bug. All right, so we'll jump to C1000. A valid command is load. So I type L, you see it jumped to space. It's now wanting me to type in the next parameter. What you type in is the drive number. This is drive one, followed by the sector number, which is essentially the tape counter of where the program you want to load is. And um, actually, we have to save this first, so let's just skip this. If I type anything bad, it kicks it out. What we need to do is save this first. So um, jump to C1000. Guess what the command is to save? It's S. And you give it a memory range, just like you did um, when we were saving the paper tape or cassette. This is in 0100 through 017F or so. That's plenty to cover it. Next, you put in the address that uh, it runs at. This is where we would put in the value at A048 to say where to start the program. That way, when you load the program, you don't have to know the execution address. It'll have it in there for you. All right, and then you specify the drive to write it to. That's drive one and what the counter you want it to start at. In other words, um, the sector number. Now, I've already got stuff on this disk. The next free spot is sector 158, so that's the counter. The second I type this last digit, you'll see it kick on. All right, okay, it wrote it. It says the last sector in use is 158, so whenever you wrote something with three or four sectors, it would have said 159 or 160. You would jot that down on your piece of paper so you know that you start one higher than that next time. So my last sector used was 158, so I know next time I save anything, I'm gonna put it at 159. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, clobber memory so we know we've cleared out the program. All right, so that program is gone. It's at least the first part of its garbage now. So now let's go ahead and see what it would take to load it. Now, fortunately, Swatbug put in a shortcut to the C1000 ROM, not just for PERCOM, but this C1000 location for ROMs kind of became a standard. They put in a shortcut where you type Z, it's done a jump to C1000. So now, I've done the same thing as before where I jumped to C1000, so I can do L, I'm running the ROM at C1000, I'm not in swap bug right now. Um, and you specify the drive, you specify the counter, which is the sector number, it's at 158, and then you specify a load address. Um, the reason you can specify a load address is if you want to override the default for it. It was pretty easy to write position independent code on the 6800, so you could write a routine that could load anywhere in memory and that would be handy for a debugger or something that had to squeeze into a spot depending on uh, where you had other things you needed to avoid. But if you just want it to use the default address that it was saved with, you type in FF here. Second I hit that last digit, it went out and loaded it, and now it's in memory. And since we saved the start address, all I have to do is hit go, and you see the program's up and running. Okay, so it worked. It was pretty simple, um, much quicker, of course, than a cassette, and you didn't have to go and advance tape counters or anything, but you're keeping track of all this with numbers. All right, so let's say we wanted to load basic. So the Z command jumps to C1000, type load. I want to load from drive one. I have a 4K basic at um, sector 10. So I put in the 10, and I want to load it just into whatever its default address is. So I put in FFFF. That's it. That's running. I hit go. That exclamation is the uh, prompt for 
this 4K basic. It's made by TSC, Technical Systems Consultants. They ended up pretty much being the software arm of Southwest Technical from this point in time on. Uh, two separate companies, but they develop most everything, including an operating system that we'll discuss later on and another video called Flex that was more of a real operating system, sort of like CPM. All right, so let's put in a simple program. Whoops, 20. It's so hard to type around this tripod. And next I. And let's print, print, done. All right, so there's our program. Let's see if this works. No, what did I do wrong? 30, next I. All right, so program works. Um, now you want to save it. How would you save it? Well, this particular 4K basic, it expects to work with paper tape and cassette and all that. So you type mon for monitor, we're back in swap bug. And this version of basic automatically sets up a002, whoops, uh, A002 with the start address and end address of your program in memory. If you remember the punch commands, you have to set up A002 through A005 with the start and end address of memory that you want to punch. So this basic has put in the address of the program. It's running from 0D55 through 0DA1. So we can just look there and we know what we have to save. So I type Z, save, the address range was 0D55 through 0DA1. Put in FFFF for the load or the execution address because this is basic, has no execution address. And now you say where to put it. Drive one. Remember our next um, available sector, let's call it our counter, is 159. So that's where we'll put this. And as soon as I type that nine, it goes out and saves it. All right. And that basic also sets up A048 and A049. So I can just type G and I'm right back into basic. All right, so let's do a scratch. All right, so now we're empty. So now to load that program, Z jumps to C1000, you say load, and you uh, give it the drive number. The counter number was 159, and we don't care about execution address. I can type go, I'm back in basic. There's our program. All right, so what we've seen here is the Percom controller with a single EEPROM in it. That is called, um, that's their mini DOS. No file names. This is pretty much a direct replacement for cassette. And this might be something you wanted to do if you had a limited amount of RAM and, and didn't want a full-fledged operating system that just the OS took up more RAM than you had. Likewise, on these disks, these are small. So we've wasted no overhead on, overhead on these disks for an operating system or a directory for that matter. So this is a good first step going on a budget from uh, cassette to something that's just a lot easier to cassette than the cassette. All right, so what we're going to do is do a video cut. I'm going to put in the MPX prom, which runs in a, with this mini disc prom that we've got and adds the ability just to lo load and save programs with file names. It keeps track of all the file names for us. And so we'll take a look at that and see how it works. All right, so I've changed my mind, and actually I think this is a good place to go ahead and wrap up this video. That means in the next video, we'll go ahead and install the MPX ROM and take a look at the more full-featured version of their OS in which you could use file names to save and load files. Also, it adds a number of commands, and that will take up a good video on its own.